Chapter One of Bill Nye's Cordwood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Brandon. Bill Nye's Cordwood by Bill Nye. Chapter One Bill Nye on the Cow Industry. A cowboy college needed to educate young men to this profession no one can go through the wide territory of montana today without being strongly impressed with the wonderful growth of the great cattle growing and grazing industry of that territory and yet montana is but the northern extremity of the great grazing belt which lies at the foot of the rocky mountains extending from the british possessions on the north to the mexican border on the south extending eastward too as far as the arable lands of dakota nebraska and kansas montana at this season of the year is the paradise of the sleek high-headed two-year-old texan steer with his tail over the dashboard as well as the stock yearling born on the range beneath the glorious mountain sky and under the auspices of roundup number twenty one i do not say this to advertise the stock growing business because it is already advertised too much anyway so many millionaires have been made with free grass and the early rising automatic branding iron that every man in the united states who has a cow that can stand the journey seems to be about to take her west and embark in business as a cattle king but let me warn the amateur cowman that in the great grazing region it takes a good many acres of thin grass to maintain the adult steer in affluence for twelve months and the great pastures at the base of the mountains are being pretty well tested moreover i believe that these great conventions of cattlemen where free grass and easily acquired fortunes are naturally advertised will tend to overstock the ranges at last and founder the goose that now lays the golden egg this of course is really none of my business but if i didn't now and then refer to matters that do not concern me i would be regarded as reticent my intention however in approaching the great cow industry which by the way is anything but an industry being in fact more like a seductive manner whereby a promissory note acquires two per cent per month without even stopping to spit on its hands was to refer incidentally to the proposition of an english friend of mine this friend seeing at once the great magnitude of the cow industry and the necessity for more and more cowboys has suggested the idea of establishing a cowboys college or training school for self-made young men who desire to become accomplished the average englishman will most always think of something that nobody else would naturally think of now our cattlemen would have gone on for years with this great steer emporium without thinking of establishing an institution where a poor boy might go and learn to rope a four-year-old in such a way as to throw him on his stomach with a sickening thud the young maverick savant could take a kindergarten course in the study of cow brands here a wide field opens up to the scholar the adult steer in the great realm of beef is now a walking chinese wash-bill a hindu poem in the original junk shop alphabet a four-legged greek inscription punctuated with jim-jams a stenographer's notes of a riot a bird's-eye view of a premature explosion in a hardware store the cowboy who can at once grapple with the great problem of where to put the steer with b bar b on left shoulder key circle g on left side heart d heart on right hip left ear crop waddle t waddle and seven hands round the dash b dash on right shoulder vented waddle on dewlap vented and p d q c o d and n g vented on right side keeping track of transfers range and post office of last owner has certainly got a future which lies mostly ahead of him but now that the idea has been turned loose i shall look forward to the time when wealthy men who have been in the habit of dying and leaving their money to other institutions 
will meet with a change of heart and begin to endow the cowboys college and the maverick hotbed of bronco sciences we live in an age of rapid advancement in all branches of learning and people who do not rise early in the morning will not retain their position in the procession i look forward with confidence to the day when no cowboy will undertake to ride the range without a diploma educated labor is what we need cowboys who can tell you in scientific terms why it is always the biggest steer that eats pigeon weed in the spring and why he should swell up and bust on a rising chicago market i hope that the day is not far distant when in the holster of the cowboy we will find the iliad instead of the Killiad, the unabridged dictionary instead of mr remington's great work on homicide as it is now on the ranges you might ride till your mexican saddle ached before you would find a cowboy who carries a dictionary with him for that reason the language used on the general roundup is at times grammatically incorrect and many of our leading cowboys spell caviard with a k a college for riding roping branding cutting out corralling loading and unloading and handling cattle generally would be a great boon to our young men who are at present groping in dark and pitiable ignorance of the habits of the untutored cow let the young man first learn how to sit up three nights in succession through a bad march snowstorm and hold a herd of restless cattle let him then ride through the hot sun and alkali dust a week or two subsisting on a chunk of disagreeable side pork just large enough to bait a trap then let his horse fall on him and injure his constitution and preamble all these things would give the cow student an idea of how to ride the range the amateur who has never tried to ride a skittish and sulky range has still a great deal to learn perhaps i have said too much on this subject but when i get thoroughly awakened on this great porterhouse steak problem i'm apt to carry the matter too far overheard in dudum why arthur what makes your hand tremble so End of chapter one recording by John Brandon Chapter two of Bill Nye's Cordwood This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Brandon Bill Nye's Cordwood by Bill Nye Chapter two a new biography of galileo some hitherto unpublished facts about the queer old italian his remarkable inventions and discoveries his books bill nye galilei commonly called galileo was born at pisa on the fourteenth day of february fifteen sixty four he was a man who discovered some of the fundamental principles underlying the movements habits and personal peculiarities of the earth he discovered things with marvelous fluency born as he was at a time when the rotary motion of the earth was still in its infancy and astronomy taught only in a crude way galileo started in to make a few discoveries and advanced some theories of which he was very fond he was the son of a musician and learned to play several instruments himself but not in such a way as to arouse the jealousy of the great musicians of his day they came and heard him play a few selections and then went home contented with their own music galileo played for several years in the band at pisa and people who heard him said that his manner of gazing out over the pison hills with a faraway look in his eye after playing a selection while he gently upended his alto horn and worked the mud valve as it poured out about a pint of moist melody that had accumulated in the flues of the instrument was simply grand at the age of twenty galileo began to discover his first discoveries were of course clumsy and poorly made but very soon he began to turn out a neat and durable discovery that would stand for years it was at this time that galileo noticed the swinging of a lamp in a church and observing that the oscillations were of equal duration he inferred that this principle might be utilized in the exact measurement of time 
from this little accident years after came the clock one of the most useful of man's dumb friends and yet there are people who will read this little incident and still hesitate about going to church galileo also invented the thermometer the microscope and the proportional compass he seemed to invent things not for the money to be obtained in that way but solely for the joy of being first on the ground he was a man of infinite genius and perseverance he was also very fair in his treatment of other inventors though he did not personally invent the rotary motion of the earth he heartily endorsed it and said it was a good thing he also came out in a card in which he said that he believed it to be a good thing and that he hoped some day to see it applied to other planets he was also the inventor of a telescope that had a magnifying power of thirty times he presented this to the venetian senate and it was used in making appropriations for river and harbor improvements by telescopic investigation galileo discovered the presence of microbes in the moon but was unable to do anything for it i have spoken of mr galileo all the way through this article informally calling him by his first name but i feel so thoroughly acquainted with him though there was such a striking difference in our ages that i am almost justified in using his given name while talking of him galileo also sat up nights and visited with venus through a long telescope which he had made himself from an old bamboo fishing rod but astronomy is a very enervating branch of science galileo frequently came down to breakfast with red heavy eyes eyes that were swollen full of unshed tears still he persevered day after day he worked and toiled year after year he went on with his task till he had worked out in his own mind the satellites of jupiter and placed a small tin tag on each one so that he would know it readily when he saw it again then he began to look up saturn's rings and investigate the freckles on the sun he did not stop at trifles but went bravely on till everybody came for miles to look at him and get him to write something funny in their albums it was not an unusual thing for galileo to get up in the morning after a wearisome night with a fretful newborn star to find his front yard full of autograph albums some of them were little red albums with floral decorations on them while others were the large plush and alligator albums of the affluent some were new and had the price tag still on them while others were old foundered albums with a droop in the back and little flecks of egg and gravy on the title page all came with a request for galileo to write a little witty characteristic sentiment in them galileo was the author of the hydrostatic paradox and other sketches he was a great reader and a fluent penman one time he was absent from home lecturing in venice for the benefit of the united aggregation of mutual admirers and did not return for two weeks so that when he got back he found the front room full of autograph albums it is said that he here demonstrated his great fluency and readiness as a thinker and writer he waited through the entire lot in two days with only two men from west pisa to assist him galileo came out of it fresh and youthful and the following night he was closeted all night with another inventor a wicker covered microscope and a bologna sandwich the investigations were carried on for two weeks after which galileo went out to the inebriate asylum and discovered some new styles of reptiles galileo was the author of a little work called i discarsi e dimostrazioni mathematicae in torus a due muove scienze it was a neat little book of about medium height and sold well on the trains for the paisan newsboys on the cars were very affable as they are now and when they came and leaned an armful of these books on a passenger's leg and poured a long tale into his ear about the wonderful beauty of the work and then pulled in the name of the book 
from the rear of the last car where it had been hanging on behind the passenger would most always buy it and enough of the name to wrap it up in he also discovered the isochronism of the pendulum he saw that the pendulum at certain seasons of the year looked yellow under the eyes and that it drooped and did not enter into its work with the old zest he began to study the case with the aid of his new bamboo telescope and wicker covered microscope as a result in ten days he had the pendulum on its feet again galileo was inclined to be liberal in his religious views and more especially in the matter of the scriptures claiming that there were passages in the bible which did not literally mean what the translator said they did this was where galileo missed it so long as he discovered stars and isochronisms and such things as that he succeeded but when he began to fool with other people's religious beliefs he got into trouble he was forced to fly from pisa we are told by the historian and we are assured at the same time that galileo who had always been far far ahead of all competitors in other things was equally successful as a fleer galileo received but sixty scudi per year for his salary at pisa and a part of that he took in town orders worth only sixty cents on the scudi End of chapter two recording by john brandon chapter three of bill nye's cordwood this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by john brandon bill nye's cordwood by bill nye chapter three methuselah a recent biographical notice of this grand old man a slave to tobacco bill nye i have just been reading james whitcomb riley's response to the old man at the annual dinner of the indianapolis literary club and his reference to methuselah has awakened in my mind many recollections and reminiscences of that grand old man we first met methuselah in the capacity of a son at the age of sixty-five enoch arose one night and telephoned his family physician to come over and assist him in meeting methuselah day at last dawned upon enoch's happy home and its first red rays lit up the still redder surface of the little stranger for three hundred years enoch and methuselah jogged along together in the capacity of father and son then enoch was suddenly cut down it was at this time that little methuselah first realized what it was to be an orphan he could not at first realize that his father was dead he could not understand why enoch with no inherited disease should be shuffled out at the age of three hundred sixty-five years but the doctor said to methuselah my son you are indeed fatherless i have done all i could but it is useless i have told enoch many a time that if he went in swimming before the ice was out of the creek it would finally down him but he thought he knew better than i did he was a headstrong man enoch was he sneered at me and alluded to me as a fresh young gosling because he was three hundred years older than i was he has received the reward of the willful and verily the doom of the smart aleck is his methuselah now cast about him for some occupation which would take up his attention and assuage his wild passionate grief over the loss of his father he entered into the walks of men and learned their ways it was at this time that he learned the pernicious habit of using tobacco we cannot wonder at it when we remember that he was now fatherless he was at the mercy of the coarse rough world possibly he learned to use tobacco when he went away to attend business college after the death of his father be that as it may the noxious weed certainly hastened his death for six hundred years after this we find him a corpse 
death is ever a surprise even at the end of a long illness and after a ripe old age to those who are near it seems abrupt so to his grandchildren some of whom survived him his children having died of old age the death of methuselah came like a thunderbolt from a clear sky methuselah succeeded in courting up more of a record such as it was than any other man of whom history informs us time the tomb builder and amateur mower came and leaned over the front fence and looked at methuselah and ran his thumb over the jagged edge of his scythe and went away whistling a low refrain he kept up this refrain business for nearly ten centuries while methuselah continued to stand out amid the general wreck of men and nations even as the young strong mower going forth with his mower to mow spareth the tall and dignified drab hornet's nests and passeth by on the other side so time with his waterbury hourglass and his overworked hay knife over his shoulder and his long mormon whiskers and his high sleek dome of thought with its grey lambrequin of hair around the base of it mowed all around methuselah and then passed on methuselah decorated the graves of those who perished in a dozen different wars he did not enlist himself for over nine hundred years of his life he was exempt he would go to the enlisting place and offer his services and the officer would tell him to go home and encourage his grandchildren to go then methuselah would sit around noah's steps and smoke and criticize the conduct of the war also the conduct of the enemy it is said of methuselah that he never was the same man after his son lamech died he was greatly attached to lamech and when he woke up one night to find his son purple in the face with membranous croup he could hardly realize that he might lose him the idea of losing a boy who had just rounded the glorious morn of his seven hundred seventy seventh year had never occurred to him but death loves a shining mark and he garnered little lammy and left methuselah to moan and mourn on for a couple of more centuries without him methuselah finally got so that he couldn't sleep after four o'clock in the morning and he didn't see how anyone else could the older he got and the less valuable his time became the earlier he would rise so that he could get an early start as the centuries filed slowly by methuselah got where all he had to do was to shuffle into his loose-fitting clothes and rest his gums on the top of a large sleek-headed cane and mutter up the chimney and then groan and extricate himself from his clothes again and retire he arose earlier and earlier in the morning and muttered more and more about the young folks sleeping away the best of the day and said he had no doubt that sleeping and snoring until breakfast time helped to carry off lamb but one day old father time came along with a new scythe and he drew the whetstone across it a few times and rolled the sleeves of his red flannel undergarment up over his warty elbows and mr methuselah passed on to that undiscovered country with a ripe experience and a long clean record we can almost fancy how the physicians who had disagreed about his case all the way through came and insisted on a post-mortem examination to prove which was right and what was really the matter with him we can imagine how people went by shaking their heads and regretting that methuselah should have tampered with tobacco when he knew it affected his heart but he is gone he lived to see his own promissory notes rise flourish acquire interest pine away at last and finally outlaw he acquired a large farm in the very heart of the county seat and refused to move or to plot it and call it methuselah's addition he came out in spring regularly for nine hundred years after he got too old to work out his poll tax on the road and put in his time telling the rising generation how to make a good road meantime other old people who were almost a hundred years of age moved away and went west where they would attract attention and command respect 
there was actually no pleasure in getting old around where methuselah was and being ordered about and scolded and kept in the background by him so when at last he died people sighed and said well it was better for him to die before he got childish it was best that he should die at a time when he knew it all we can't help thinking what an acquisition methuselah will be on the evergreen shore when he gets there with all his ripe experience and habits of early rising and the next morning after the funeral methuselah's family did not get out of bed till nine o'clock end of chapter three recording by john brandon chapter four of bill nye's cordwood this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by john brandon bill nye's cordwood by bill nye chapter four notes on some spring styles the lady's favorite bonnet and hosiery the small dog worn in shades to match the costume prevailing fashions for gentlemen bill nye it is customary at this season of the year to poke fun at the good clothes of our friends and well-wishers the ladies but it occurs to me that this spring there is a very small field for the witty and sarcastic critic of female attire there has not been a time since i first began to make a study of this branch of science when the ladies seem to have manifested better taste or sounder judgment in the matter of dress even bonnets seem to be less grotesque this season than heretofore although the high startled bonnet the bonnet that may be characterized as the excelsior bonnet is still retained by some though how it is retained has always been a mystery to me perhaps it holds its place in society by means of a long black pin which apparently passes through the brain of the wearer black hosiery continues to be very popular i am informed sometimes it is worn clocked and then again it is worn crocked the crockless black stocking is gaining in favor in our best circles i am pleased to note nothing looks more mortified than a foot that has been inside of a crockable stocking all through a long hot summer day i am very glad to notice that the effort made a few years ago by a french reformer to abolish the stocking on the ground of unhealthfulness has met with well-merited failure the custom of wearing hosiery is one that does great credit to the spirit of american progress which cannot be thwarted by the puny hand of foreign interference or despotic intervention street costumes of handsomely fitting and unobtrusive shades of soft and comfortable goods will be generally in favor and the beautiful and symmetrical american arm with a neatly fitting sleeve on the outside of it will gladden the hearts of the casual spectator once more the lady with the acute elbow and the italicized clavicle will make a strong effort this season to abolish the close-fitting and extremely attractive sleeve but it will be futile the small dog will be worn this season in shades to match the costume for dark and brown combinations in street dresses the black and tan dog will be very much in favor while the black and drab pug will be affected by those wearing those shades in dress small pugs that are warranted not to bag at the knees are commanding a good price spitz dogs to match lynx and fox trimmed garments or spring wraps are now being sprinkled with camphor and laid aside for the summer coach dogs of the spotted variety will be worn with polka dot costumes tall willowy hounds with wire tails will be much affected by slender young ladies and hydrophobia antique dogs with weak eyes asthma and an air of languor will be used a great deal this season to decorate lawns and railroad crossings young dogs that are just budding into doghood will be noticed through the spring months trying their new teeth on the light spring pantaloons of male pedestrians 
styles in gentlemen's clothing have not materially changed lavender pantaloons with an air of settled melancholy and benzine are now making their appearance and young men trying to eradicate the droop in the knees of last summer's garment may be seen in their luxurious apartments most any calm spring evening an old nail brush with a solution of ammonia and prussic acid will remove traces of custard pie from light shades in pantaloons this preparation will also remove the pantaloons the umbrella will be worn over the shoulder and in the eye of the passing pedestrian very much as usual on pleasant days and left behind the door in a dark closet on rainy days gentlemen will wear one pocket handkerchief in the side pocket with a corner gently emerging and another in the hip pocket as they did last season the former for decorative purposes and the latter for business this is a wise provision and never fails to elicit favorable comment the custom of wearing a few kernels of roasted coffee or a dozen cloves in the little cigarette pocket of the cutaway coat will still continue and the supply will be replenished between the acts as heretofore straw hats will be chased down the streets this spring by the same gentlemen who chased them last spring and in some instances the same hats will be used shade trees will be worn a little lower this summer and will therefore succeed in wiping off a larger crop of plug hats it is hoped linen dusters with the pockets carefully soldered together have not yet made their appearance End of chapter four recording by john brandon chapter five of bill nye's cordwood this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by phil schempf bill nye's cordwood by bill nye hunting an ichthyosaurus the victims of a practical joke tramped five days along bitter creek in search of an animal that had been dead five thousand years several years ago i had the pleasure of joining a party about to start out along the banks of bitter creek on a hunting expedition the leader of the party was a young man who had recently escaped from college with a large amount of knowledge which he desired to experiment with on the people of the far west he had heard that there was an ichthyosaurus up somewhere along the west side of bitter creek and he wanted us to go along and help him find it i had been in the west some eight or nine years then and i had never seen an ichthyosaurus myself but i thought the young man must know his business so i got out my winchester and went along with the group we tramped over the pale ashy glaring staring stretch of desolation through burning quivering days of monotony and sagebrush and alkali water and aching eyes and parched and bleeding lips and nostrils cut through and eaten by the sharp alkaline air mentally depressed and physically worn out but cheered on and braced up by the light and joyous manner of the ever hopeful james trilobite eaton of concord james trilobite eaton of concord never moaned never gigged back or shed a hot remorseful tear in this powdery hungry waste of gray parched ruin no regret came forth from his lips in the midst of this mighty cemetery this ghastly potter's field for all that nature had ever reared that was too poor to bear its own funeral expenses now and then a lean soiled gray coyote without sufficient moral courage to look a dead mule in the hind foot slipped across the horizon like a dirty phantom and faded into the hot and tremulous atmosphere we scorned such game as that and trudged on cheered by the hope that seemed to spring eternal in the breast of james trilobite eaton of concord four days we wallowed through the unchanging desolation four nights we went through the motions of slumbering on the arid bosom of the wasted earth on the fifth day james trilobite eaton said we were now getting near the point where we would find what we sought on we pressed through the keen rough blades of the seldom bunch grass over the shifting yellow sand and the greenish gray of the badland soil 
which never does anything but sit around through the accumulating centuries and hold the world together a kind of powdery poison that delights to creep into the nostrils of the pilgrim and steal away his brains or when moistened by a little snow to accumulate around the feet of the pilgrim or on the feet of the pilgrim's mule till he has the most of the unsurveyed forty on each foot and the casual observer is cheered by the novel sight of one homestead striving to jump another toward evening james trilobite eaton gave a wild shriek of joy and ran to us from the bed of an old creek where he had found an ichthyosaurus the animal was dead not only that but it had been dead a long long time james milton sherrod said that if a college education was of no more use to a man than that he for one allowed that his boy would have to grope through life with an academical education and very little of it i uncocked my gun and went back to camp a sadder and madder man and though years have come and gone i am still irritable when i think of the five days we tramped along bitter creek searching for an animal that was no longer alive and our guide knew it before he started i ventured to say to j trilobite eaton that night as we sat together in the gloaming discussing whether he should be taken home with us in the capacity of a guide or as remains that it seemed to me a man ought to have better sense than to wear his young life away trying to have fun with his superiors in that way why blame it all says james what did you expect you ought to know yourself that that animal is extinct extinct says james milton sherrod in shrill angry tones i should say he was extinct that's what we're kicking about what galled me was that you should have waited till the old cuss was extinct before you come to us like a man and told us about it you pulled us through the sand for a week and blistered our heels and come dim near kill us and all the time you know that the blame brute is layin there in the hot sun gettin more and more extinct every minute fun is fun and i like a little nonsense now and then just as well as you do but i'll be eternally banished to bitter creek if i think it's square or right or white to play it on your friends this kind of way you claim that the animal's been dead going on five thousand years or some such thing as that and try to get out of it that way but long as you knew it and we didn't it shows that you're a low cuss not to speak of it what difference does it make to us i say whether this brute was or was not dead and swelled up like a pison steer long before nor got his zoological show together we didn't know it we haven't seen the salt lake papers for weeks you use your education to fool people with my opinion is that the day is not far distant when you will wake up and find yourself in the bottom of an untimely grave you bring us a hundred and fifty miles to look at an old bone pile all tramped into the ground and then say the animal is extinct that's a great way to talk to an old man like me a man old enough to be your grandfather probably you calculated that it is a rare treat for an old-timer like me to waller through from green river to the yallerstone and then hear a young kangaroo with a moth-eaten eyebrow under his nose burst forth into a rollicking laugh and say that the animal we've been trailing for five days is extinct i just want to say to you james trilobite eaton and i say it for your good and i say it with no prejudice against you for i want to see you succeed that if this ever happens again and you are the party to blame you will wake up with a wild start on the follerin day and find yourself a good deal extincter than this here old busted lizard is end of chapter five chapter six of bill nye's cordwood this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Yael. Bill Nye's Cordwood by Bill Nye. Chapter 6. True Merit Rewarded. Style of school literature known 30 years ago. One of Bill Nye's selections written by himself, arranged with special reference to the matter of choice, delicate and difficult words. 
One day, as George Oswald was going to his tasks, and while passing through the wood, he spied a tall man approaching in an opposite direction along the highway. Ah, thought George in a low, mellow tone of voice, whom have we here? Good morning, my fine fellow, exclaimed the stranger pleasantly. Do you reside in this locality? Indeed I do, retorted George, cheerily dropping his cap. In yonder cottage near the glen, my widowed mother and her thirteen children dwell with me. And how did your papa die? asked the man, as he thoughtfully stood on the other foot a while. Alas, sir, said George, as a large hot tear stole down his pale cheek and fell with a loud report on the warty surface of his bare foot. He was lost at sea in a bitter gale. The good ship foundered two years ago last Christmas tide, and father was foundered at the same time. No one knew of the loss of the ship and that the crew was drowned until the next spring, and it was then too late. And what is your age, my fine fellow? quoth the stranger. If I live until next October, said the boy, in a declamatory tone of voice suitable for a second reader, I will be seven years of age. A large family of children. And who provides for your mother and her large family of children? queried the man. Indeed I do, sir, replied George in a shrill tone. I toil oh so hard, sir, for we are very, very poor, and since my elder sister Anne was married and brought her husband home to live with us, I have to toil more assiduously than heretofore. And by what means do you obtain a livelihood? exclaimed the man in slowly measured and grammatical words. By digging wells, kind sir, replied George, picking up a tired ant as he spoke, and stroking it on the back. I have a good education, and so I am enabled to dig wells as well as a man. I do this daytimes and take in washing at night. In this way I am enabled to maintain our family in a precarious manner. But, oh sir, should my other sisters marry, I fear that some of my brothers-in-law would have to suffer. You are indeed a brave lad, exclaimed the stranger, as he repressed a smile. And do you not at times become very wary and wish for other ways of passing your time? Indeed I do, sir, said the lad. I would fain run and romp and be gay like other boys, but I must engage in constant manual exercise, or we will have no bread to eat, and I have not seen a pie since Papa perished in the moist and moaning sea. Saved from a hurried grave. And what if I were to tell you that your papa did not perish at sea, but was saved from a hurried grave? asked the stranger in pleasing tones. Ah, sir, exclaimed George in a genteel manner, again doffing his cap. I'm too polite to tell you what I would say. And besides, sir, you are much larger than I am. But, my brave lad, said the man in low musical tones, do you not know me, Georgie? Oh, George! I must say, replied George, that you have the advantage of me. Whilst I have met you before, I cannot at this moment place you, sir. My son, oh, my son, murmured the man, at the same time taking a large strawberry mark out of the valley and showing it to the lad. Do you not recognize your parent on your father's side? When our good ship went to the bottom, all perished saved me. I swam several miles through the billows, and at last, utterly exhausted, gave up all hopes of life. Suddenly a bright idea came to me, and I walked out of the sea and rested myself. And now, my brave boy, exclaimed the man with great glee, see what I have brought for you. It was but the work of a moment to unclasp from a shawl strap, which he held in his hand, and present to George's astonished gaze, a large forty-cent watermelon, which he had brought with him from the Orient. Ah, said George, this is indeed a glad surprise. I'll bait, how can I ever repay you? Bill Nye in Boston Globe End of chapter 6 Recording by Yael Chapter 7 of Bill Nye's Cordwood This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Bill Nye's Cordwood by Bill Nye Chapter 7 Bill Nye Condoles with Cleveland Surprise expressed that the President should take a mother-in-law into his cabinet, and add housekeeping to his other agony. Hudson, Wisconsin, June 3, 1886 
The Honorable Grover Cleveland, Washington, D.C. My dear sir, you have now assumed a new duty and taken upon yourself an additional responsibility, not content with the great weight of national affairs sufficient to crush any other pachyderm, you have cheerfully and almost gleefully become a married man. While I cannot agree with you politically, Grover, I am forced to admire your courage. This morning a new life opens out to you, the life of a married man. It is indeed a humiliating situation. To be a President of the United States, the roust about of a free people, is a trying situation. But to be a newly married President, married in the full glare of official life, with the eye of a divided constituency upon you, is to place yourself where nerve is absolutely essential. I too am married, but not under such trying circumstances. Others have been married and still lived, but it has remained for you, Mr. President, young as you are, to pose as a newly wedded President and to take your new mother-in-law into the cabinet with you. For this reason I say freely that to walk a slack rope across the moist brow of Niagara and carry a nervous man in a wheelbarrow sinks into a mere commonplace. Daniel, playing tag with a den full of half-starved lions, becomes a historic cipher, and the Hebrew children, sitting on a rosy bed of red-hot clinkers in the fiery furnace, are almost forgotten. With a large wad of civil service wedged in among your back teeth, a larger fragment perhaps than you were prepared to masticate when you bit it off, with an agonized southern democracy and a clamorous northern constituency, with disappointment poorly concealed among your friends and hilarity openly expressed by your enemies, with the snarl of the vanquished Mr. Davis, who is at one time a sort of president himself, as he rolls up future majorities for your foes, with a lot of sharp-witted journalists walking all over you every twenty-four hours and climbing up your stalwart frame with their telegraph repair boots on, I am surprised, Grover honestly as between man and man that you should have tried to add housekeeping to all this other agony had you been young and tender under the wings i might have understood it but you must admit in the quiet and sanctity of your own home grover that you are no gosling you have arrived at man's estate you have climbed the barbed wire fence which separates the fluff and bloom and blossom and bumblebees of impetuous youth from the yellow fields and shadowy orchards of middle life you now stand in the full glare of life's meridian. You are entering upon a new experience. Possibly you think that because you are president, the annoyances peculiar to the life of a new green groom will not reach you. Do not fool yourself in this matter. Others have made the same mistake. Position, wealth, and fame cannot shut out the awkward and trying circumstances which attend the married man even as the sparks are prone to fly upward. It will seem odd to you at first, Mr. President, after the affairs of the nation have been put aside for the day and the government fireproof safe locked up for the night, to go up to your boudoir and converse with a bride with one corner of her mouth full of pins. A man may write a pretty fair message to Congress, one that will be accepted and printed all over the country, and yet he may not be fitted to hold a conversation with one corner of a woman's mouth while the other is filled with pins. To some men it is given to be greatest statesmen, while to others it is given to be fluent conversationalists under these circumstances. Mr. President, I may be taking a great liberty in writing to you and touching upon your private affairs, but I noticed that everybody else was doing it, and so I have nerved myself up to write you, having once been a married man myself, though not, as I said, under the same circumstances. When I was married I was only a plain justice of the peace plodding quietly along and striving to do my duty. You was then sheriff of your county. Little did we think in those days that now you would be a freshly married president, and I the author of several pieces which have been printed in the papers. Little did we think then, when I was a justice of the peace in Wyoming, and you a sheriff in New York, that today your Timothy lawn would be kicked all to pieces by your admiring constituents, while I would be known and loved wherever the English language is tampered with. So we have risen together, you to a point from which you may be easily observed and flayed alive by the newspapers, while I am the same pleasant, unassuming, gentlemanly friend of the poor that I was when only a justice of the peace and comparatively unknown. I cannot close this letter without expressing a wish that your married life may be a joyous one, as the paper at Laramie has said, 
and that no cloud may ever come to mar the horizon of your wedded bliss. This sentence is not my own. I copy it verbatim from a wedding notice of my own written by a Western journalist who is now at the old woman's home. Mr. President, I hope you will not feel that I have been too forward in writing to you personally over my own name. I mean to do what is best for you. You can truly say that all I have ever done in this way has been for your good. I speak in a plain way sometimes, but I don't beat about the bush. I see that you do not want to have any engrossed bills sent to you for a couple of weeks. That's the way I was. I told all my creditors to withhold their engrossed bills during my honeymoon, as I was otherwise engrossed. This remark made me a great many friends and added to my large circle of creditors. It was afterward printed in a foreign paper and explained in a supplement of eight pages. We are all pretty well here at home. I may go to Washington this fall if I can sell a block of stock in the pauper's dream, a rich gold claim of mine on Elk Mountain. It is a very rich claim, but needs capital to develop it. This remark is not original with me. I quote from an exchange. If I do come over to Washington, do not let that make any difference in your plans. If I thought your wife would send out to the neighbors and borrow dishes and such things on my account, I would not go a step. Just stick your head out of the window and whistle as soon as the cabinet is gone, and I will come up there and spend the evening. Remember that I have not grown cold toward you just because you have married. You will find me the kind of a friend who will not desert you just when you are in trouble. Yours, as heretofore, Bill Nye. P.S. I send you today a card receiver. It looks like silver. Do not let your wife bear on too hard when she polishes it. I was afraid you might try to start into keeping house without a card receiver, so I bought this yesterday. When I got married, I forgot to buy a card receiver, and I guess we would have frozen to death before we could have purchased one. But friends were more thoughtful, and there were nine of them among the gifts. If you decide that it would not be proper for you to receive presents, you may return the card receiver to me or put it in the cellar way till I come over there this fall. B. N. End of section 7 Recording by Philip Gould Chapter 8 of Bill Nye's Cordwood This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Penn Bill Nye's Cordwood by Bill Nye No doubt as to his condition. Harry, I hear that you have lost your father. Allow me to express my sympathy. Jack, with a sigh. Thank you. Yes, he is gone, but the event was expected for a long time and the blow was consequently less severe than if it had not been looked for. Harry. His property was large? Jack. Yes, something like a quarter of a million. Harry. I heard that his intellect, owing to his illness, was somewhat feeble during his latter years. Is there any probability of the will being contested? Jack. No. Father was quite sane when he made his will. He left everything to me. End of No Doubt as to His Condition Cyclones We were riding along on the boundary train yesterday, and someone spoke of the free and democratic way that people in this country got acquainted with each other while traveling. Then we got to talking about railway sociability and railway etiquette, when a young man from East Jasper, who had wildly jumped and grabbed his valise every time the train hesitated, said that it was queer what railway travel would do in the way of throwing people together. He said that in Nebraska once, he and a large, corpulent gentleman, both total strangers, were thrown together while trying to jump a washout, and an intimacy sprang up between them that had ripened into open hostility. From that, we got to talking about natural phenomena in storms. I spoke of the cyclone with some feeling, and a little bitterness, perhaps, briefly telling my own experience and making the storm as loud and wet and violent as possible. Then a gentleman from Kansas, named George L. Murdoch, an old cattleman, was telling of a cyclone that came across his range two years ago last September. The sky was clear to begin with, and then all at once, as Mr. Murdoch states, a little cloud no larger than a man's hand might have been seen. 
it moved toward the southwest gently with its hands in its pockets for a few moments and then mr murdoch discovered that it was of a pale green color about sixteen hands high with dark blue mane and tail about a mile from where he stood the cyclone with great force swooped down and with a muffled roar swept a quarter section of land out from under a heavy mortgage without injuring the mortgage in the least he says that people came for miles the following day to see the mortgage still on file at the office of the register of deeds and just as good as ever then a gentleman named bean of western minnesota a man who went there in an early day and homesteaded it when his nearest neighbor was fifty miles away spoke of a cyclone that visited his county before the telegraph or railroad had penetrated that part of the state mr bean said it was very clear up to the moment he noticed a cloud in the northwest no larger than a man's hand it sauntered down in a southwesterly direction like a cyclone that had all summer to do its chores in then it gave two quick snorts and a roar wiped out of existence all the farm buildings he had sucked the well dry soured all the milk in the milk house and spread desolation all over that quarter section but mr bean said that the most remarkable thing he remembered was this he had dug about a pint of angleworms that morning intending to go over to the lake toward evening and catch a few perch but when the cyclone came it picked up those angleworms and drove them head first through his new grindstone without injuring the worms or impairing the grindstone he would have had the grindstone photographed he said if the angleworms could have been kept still long enough he said that they were driven just far enough through to hang on the other side like a lambrequin the cyclone is certainly a wonderful phenomenon its movements are so erratic and in direct violation of all known rules mr lewis p barker of northern iowa was also on the car and he described a cyclone that he saw in the seventies along in september at the close of a hot but clear day the first intimation that mr barker had of an approaching storm was a small cloud no larger than a man's hand which he discovered moving slowly toward the southwest with a gyratory movement it then appeared to be a funnel-shaped cloud which passed along near the surface of the ground with its apex now and then lightly touching a barn or a well and pulling it out by the roots it would then bound lightly into the air and spit on his hands what he noticed most carefully on the following day was the wonderful evidences of its powerful suction it sucked a milch cow absolutely dry pulled all the water out of his cistern and then went around to the wastewater pipe that led from the bathroom and drew a two-year-old child who was taking a bath at the time clear down through the two-inch waste pipe a distance of a hundred and fifty feet he had two inches of pipe with him and a lock of hair from the child's head it is such circumstances as these coming to us from the mouths of eye-witnesses that leads us to explain how prolific is nature and how wonderful are all her works including poor weak man man who comes into the world clothed in a little brief authority perhaps and nothing else to speak of he rises up in the morning prevaricates and dies where are our best liars to-day look for them where you will and you will find that they are passing away go into the cemetery and there you will find them mingling with the dust but striving still to perpetuate their business by marking their tombs with a gentle prevarication chiselled in enduring stone i have heard it intimated by people who seem to know what they are talking about that truth is mighty and will prevail but i did not see much show for her till the cyclone season is over end of cyclones chapter nine of bill nye's cordwood this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Bill Nye's Cordwood by Bill Nye The Earth The Earth is that body in the solar system which most of my readers now reside upon, and which some of them, I regret to say, modestly desire to own and control. 
forgetting that the earth is the lord's and the fullness thereof some men do not care who owns the earth so long as they get the fullness the earth is five hundred million years of age according to professor proctor but she doesn't look it to me the duke of argyle maintains that she is ten million years old last august but what does an ordinary duke know about these things so far as i am concerned i will put proctor's memory against that of any low-priced duke that i have ever seen newton claimed that the earth would gradually dry up and become porous and that water would at last become a curiosity many believe this and are rapidly preparing their systems by a rigid course of treatment so that they can live for years without the use of water internally or externally other scientists who have sat up nights to monkey with the solar system and thereby shattered their nervous systems claim that the earth is getting top heavy at the north pole and that one of these days while we are thinking of something else the great weight of accumulated ice snow and the vast accumulation of second-hand arctic relief expeditions will jerk the earth out of its present position with so much spontaneity and in such an extremely forthwith manner that many people will be permanently strabismused and much bric-a-brac will be for sale at a great sacrifice this may or may not be true i have not been up in the arctic regions to investigate its truth or falsity though there seems to be a growing sentiment throughout the country in favour of my going a great many people during the past year have written me and given me their consent if i could take about twenty good picked men and go up there for the summer instead of bringing back twenty picked men i wouldn't mind the trip and i feel that we really ought to have a larger colony on ice in that region than we now have the earth is composed of land and water some of the water has large chunks of ice in it the earth revolves around its own axle once in twenty-four hours though it seems to revolve faster than that and to wobble a good deal during the holidays nothing tickles the earth more than to confuse a man when he is coming home late at night and then to rise up suddenly and hit him in the back with a town lot people who think there is no fun or relaxation among the heavenly bodies certainly have not studied their habits even the moon is a humorist a friend of mine who was returning late at night from a regular meeting of the society for the amelioration of the hot scotch said that the earth rose up suddenly in front of him and hit him with a right of way and as he was about to rise up again he was stunned by a terrific blow between the shoulder blades with an old land grant that he thought had lapsed years ago when he staggered to his feet he found that the moon in order to add to his confusion had gone down in front of him and risen again behind him with her thumb on her nose so i say without fear of successful contradiction that if you do not think that planets and orbs and one thing and another have fun on the quiet you are grossly ignorant of their habits the earth is about half way between mercury and saturn in the matter of density mercury is of about the specific gravity of iron while that of saturn corresponds with that of cork in the matter of density and specific gravity the earth of course does not compare with mercury in the matter of solidity yet it is amply firm for all practical purposes 
a negro who fell out of the tower of a twelve-storey building while trying to clean the upper window by drinking a quart of alcohol and then breathing hard on the glass says that he regards the earth as perfectly solid and safe to do business on for years to come he claims that those who maintain that the earth's crust is only two thousand five hundred miles in thickness have not thoroughly tested the matter by a system of practical experiments the poles of the earth are merely imaginary i hate to print this statement in a large paper in such a way as to injure the reputation of great writers on this subject who still cling to the theory that the earth revolves upon large poles and that the aurora borealis is but the reflection from a hot box at the north pole but i am here to tell the truth and if my readers think it disagreeable to read the truth what must be my anguish who have to tell it the mean diameter of the earth is seven thousand nine hundred and sixteen english statute miles but the actual diameter from pole to pole is a still meaner diameter being seven thousand eight hundred and ninety nine miles while the equatorial diameter is seven thousand nine hundred and twenty five and a half miles the long and patient struggle of our earnest and tireless geographers and savants in past years in order to obtain these figures and have them exact few can fully realize the long and thankless job of measuring the diameter of the earth no matter what the weather might be away from home and friends footsore and weary still plodding on fatigued but determined to know the mean diameter of the earth even if it took a leg measuring on for thousands of weary miles and getting farther and farther away from home and then forgetting perhaps how many thousand miles they had gone and being compelled to go back and measure it over again while their noses got red and their fingers were benumbed these fellow citizens are a few of the sacrifices that science has made on our behalf in order that we may not grow up in ignorance these are a few of the blessed privileges which along with life liberty and the pursuit of happiness are ours ours to anticipate ours to participate ours to precipitate End of chapter 9。Chapter 10 of Bill Nye's Cordwood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, BC. Bill Nye's Cordwood by Bill Nye Francisco Pizarro's Career Born in shame and reared among swine, he conquers fame and fortune in Peru with the sword. History of a Self-Made Man Perhaps the history of the Western Hemisphere has never furnished a more wonderful example of the self-made man that may be found in the person of francisco pizarro a gentleman who came to america about fifteen ten intending to grow up with the country mr pizarro was born at truxillo spain about fourteen seventy one his father was a spanish colonial of foot and his mother was a peasant girl who admired and respected the dashing colonial very much but felt that she had scruples about marriage and so although years afterward francisco tried his best to make a match between his father and mother they were never married it is said that this embittered his whole life none but those who have experienced it can fully realize what it is to have a thankless parent 
pizarro's mother's name was estramadura this was her maiden name it was a name which seemed to harmonize well with her rich pickled olive complexion and so she retained it all her life her son did not have many early advantages for he was neglected by his mother and allowed to grow up in a swineherd and it is even said that he was suckled by swine in his infancy while his giddy mother joined in the mad whirl at the skating rink we can hardly imagine anything more pitiable than the condition of a little child left to rustle for nourishment among the black and tan hogs of spain while his father played old sledge on the frontier in the regular army and his mother stood on her spanish head and wrote her cigar box name in the atmosphere at the rink poor little pizarro had none of the modern advantages therefore and his education was extremely crude the historian says that he grew up a bold ignorant and brutal man he came to what was then called spanish america at the age of thirty-nine years and assisted mr balboa in discovering the pacific ocean having heard of the existence of peru with all its wealth pizarro secured a band of self-made men like himself and lit out for that province for the purpose of conquering it if he liked it and bring home some solid silver teapots and gold lined card receivers he was engaged in gathering this line of goods and working them off on the pawnbroker for twenty-one years during which time he did not get killed but continued to enjoy a reasonable degree of health and strength although peru at time was quite densely populated with an industrious and wealthy class of natives pizarro subdued her with a hundred and ten foot soldiers armed with old-fashioned muskets that had these full-blown barrels with muzzles on them like the business end of a tuba horn sixty-seven mounted men and two toy cannon loaded with carpet tacks with no education and what was still harder to bear the inner consciousness that his parents were plain common everyday people whose position in life would not advance him in the estimation of the peruvians he battled on his efforts were crowned with success inasmuch that at the close of the year fifteen thirty two peace was declared and he could breathe the free air once more without fear of getting a bronze arrowhead mixed up with his kidneys when his back was turned for the first time in two years said the historian pizarro was able to take off his tin helmet and his sheet iron corset at night when he lay down to rest or undismayed to go forth bareheaded and wearing only his crinkled seersucker coat and a pair of sandals at the twilight hour and till midnight wander alone amid the famous guano groves of peru such is the history of a man who never even knew how to write his own name he won fame for himself and great wealth without an education or a long dark blue lineage pizarro was like job you know we sometimes sing o job he was a fine young lad sing glory hallelujah his heart was good but his blood was bad sing glory hallelujah so pizarro could not brag on his blood and his education was not classical he could not write his name though he tried faithfully for many years day after day during the campaign and late into the night when the yaller dogs of lima came forth with their peruvian bark he would get his orderly surgeon to set him the copy paul may plant an apollonius water but it is god that giveth the increase 
then pizarro would bring out his writing material and his tongue and try to write but he never could do it he was not a studious mind it was more on the knock-down and drag-out order pizarro was made a marquis in after years he was also made a corpse he acquired the latter position toward the close of his life he at one time married the inca's daughter and found a long line of grandees marquises and macaroni sculptures whose names may be founded on the covers of imported cigar boxes and in the topmost tier of the wrought iron resorts in our best penitentiaries pizarro lived a very busy life during the conquest some days killing as many as seventy and eighty peruvians between sun and sun but death at last crooked his finger at the marquis and he slept we all brag and blow our horn here for a few brief years it is true but when the grim reaper with his new and automatic twine binder comes along he gathers us in the weak and the strong, the ignorant and the educated, the plain and the beautiful, the young and the old, those who have just sniffed the sweet and dew-laden air of life's morning, and those who are footsore and weary and waiting, all alike must bow low to the sickle that goes on cutting closer and closer to us, even when we sleep had pizarro thought more about this matter he would have been ahead to-day end of chapter ten recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter eleven of bill nye's cordwood this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by L.T. Bill Nye's Cordwood by Bill Nye. Chapter 11. Bill Nye Discovers. He discovers a man with an idea, a new plan of running a good hotel, improvements for which people pay in advance. The following circular from a hotel man in Kansas is going about over the country and it certainly deserves more than a passing notice. I changed the name of the hotel and proprietor in order to avoid giving any free boom to a man who seems to be thoroughly self-reliant and able to take care of himself. The rest of the circular is accurately copied. Kansas, dear sir, not having enough room under our present arrangements and wishing to make the roller towel house the recognized headquarters for traveling men, we desire to enlarge the building. Not having the money on hand to do so, we make the following proposition. If you will advance us five dollars to be used for the above purpose, we will deduct that amount from your bill when stopping with us. We feel assured that the traveling men appreciate our efforts to give them first-class accommodations, and as the above amount will be deducted from your bill when stopping with us, we hope for a favorable reply. Should you not visit our town again, the loan will be repaid in cash. J. Crash Towel, Proprietor, Roller Towel House here we have a man with a quiet gentlemanly way and yet withal a cool level head a man who knows when he needs more room and how best to go to work to remedy that defect mr towel sees that another row of sleeping rooms cut low in the ceiling is actually needed in fancy he already sees these rooms added to his house each has a strip of hemp carpet in front of the bed and a cute little green shade over the window a shade that falls down when we try to adjust it filling the room with kansas dust in his dreams he sees each room fitted out with one of these smooth, deceptive beds that are all right until we begin to use them for sleeping purposes, a bed that the tall man lies diagonally across and groans through the live-long night. Mr. Towel has made a rapid calculation on the buttered side of a menu and ascertained that if one half the traveling men in the United States would kindly advance five dollars to be refunded in case they did not decide to make a tour to the roller towel house and to be taken out of the bill in case they did, the amount so received would not only add a row of compressed hot air bedrooms with flexible soap and a delirious looking glass but also ensure an electric button which may or may not connect with the office and over which said button the following epitaph could be erected one ring for bellboy 
two rings for porter, three rings for ice water, four rings for rough on rats, five rings for borrowed money, six rings for fire, seven rings for hook and ladder company. In fact, a man could have rings on his fingers and bellboys on his toes all the time if he wanted to do so. And yet there will be traveling men who will receive this kind circular and still hang back. Constant contact with a cold, cruel world has made them cynical, and they will hesitate even after Mr. Towell has said that he will improve his house with the money, and even after he has assured us that we need not visit Kansas at all if we will advance the money. This shows that he is not altogether a heartless man. Mr. Towell may be poor, but he is not without consideration for the feelings of people who loan him money. For my part, I fully believe that Mr. Towell would be willing to fit up his house and put matches in each room if traveling men throughout the country would respond to his call for assistance. But the trouble is that the traveling public expect a landlord to take all the risks and advance all the money. This makes the matter of hotel keeping a hazardous one. Mr. Towell asks the guests to become an interested party. Not that he in so many words agrees to divide the profits proportionately at the end of the year with the stockholders, but he is willing to make his hotel larger, and if food does not come up as fast as it goes down, in price I mean, he will try to make all his guests feel perfectly comfortable while in his house. Under favorable circumstances, the roller towel house would no doubt be thoroughly refitted and refurnished throughout. The little writing table in each room would have its legs re-glued, new wicks would be inserted in the kerosene lamps, the stairs would be dazzled over with soft soap, and the teeth in the comb down in the washroom would be reset and filled. Numerous changes would be made in the corpse de ballet also. The large-handed chambermaid with the cow-catcher teeth and the red Brazil nut of hair on the back of her head would be sent down in the dining room to recite that little rhetorical burst so often rendered by the elocutionist of the dining room, the smart elocutionist, in the language of the poet, beginning beefsteak, perk steak, and colts, with a falling inflection that sticks its head in the bosom of the earth and gives its tail a tremolo movement in the air. On receipt of five dollars from each one of the traveling men of the Union, new hinges would be put into the slippery elm towels. The pink soap would be re-varnished. The different kinds of meat on the table will have tags on them, stating in plain words what kinds of meat they are so that guests will not be forced to take the word of servant or to rely on their own judgment. Fresh vinegar with a sour taste to it and without microbes will be put in the cruets. The old and useless cockroaches will be discharged and the latest and most approved adjuncts of hotel life will be adopted. Why, then, should the traveling man hesitate? Why should he doubt and draw back, falter and shrink? Why should he allow pessimism and other foreign substances to get into his system and change his whole life? Let him remit five dollars to the roller towel house, and if this should prove a success, he may assist other hotels in the same manner. He would thus feel an interest in their growth and prosperity. Then, as he became more and more forehanded, he could assist the railroads, the bus lines, and the boot blacks, barbers, laundries, etc., in the same manner. I would like to call upon the American people in the same way. I would like very much to establish a nice, expensive home for inebriates. It would cost, properly fitted up, about seven hundred fifty or eight hundred thousand dollars. If those who read this article will lend fifty dollars by express or draft, I will take it out of their bill the first time that they stop at my new and attractive inebriate asylum. Who will be the first to contribute? Boston Globe End of chapter 11Please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by L.T. Bill Nye's Cordwood by Bill Nye. Chapter 12. Bill Nye Incubates. My dear son, we are still pegging along here at home in the same old way, your mother and me. We are neither of us real well, and yet I suppose we are as well as folks at our time of life could expect to be. Your mother has a good deal of pain in her side all the while, and I'm off my feed more or less in the morning. Doc has fixed me up some condition powders that he says will straighten me out right away. Perhaps so. Doc has straightened out a good many people in his time. I wish I had as many dollars as he has straightened out people. 
Most every spring I've had to take a little dandelion root limbered up with gin, but this year that didn't seem to get there, as the boys say. I fixed up a dose of it and took it day and night for a week till I wore that old dandelion root clear down to skin and bone. But in ten days my appetite was worse than ever and I had a head on me like a two-year-old colt. Dandelion root never served me that way before, and your mother thinks that the goodness is all out of it, maybe. It's the same old dandelion root I've been using for twenty years, and I believe that when you've tried a thing and it's proved good, you oughtn't to change off. I tried to get your mother to take a dose of it last week for the pain on her side. Fixed up a two-quart jug of it for her, but she can't bear the smell of gin, so I had to take it myself. Dandelion is a great purifier of the blood, Henry. Some days after I've been taking this dandelion root for an hour or two, I feel as if my blood was pretty near pure enough. I feel like a new man. You know I wrote you last winter, Henry, that I was going to buy some new-fangled hens in the spring and get into the egg business? Well, I sent east in March for a couple of fowls, one of each sect. They came at nine dollars per pair over and above railroad charges, which was some four thirty-five more on top of that. I thought that as soon as the hen got here and got her things off and got rested, she would proceed to lay some of these here high-priced eggs, which we read about in the Poultry Keeper's Guide and American Eggist. But she seemed pensive, and when I tried to get acquainted with her, she would cluck in a croupy tone of voice and go away. The rooster was no doubt a fine-looking brute when he was shipped, but when he got here he strolled around with a preoccupied air and seemed to feel above us. He was a polka-dot rooster with gray mane and tail, and he was no doubt refined, but I did not think he should feel above his business, for we are only plain people who are accustomed to the self-made American hen. He seemed bored all the time, and I could see by the way he acted that he pined to be back in Fremont O, having his picture taken for the poultry keeper's guide and American eggist. He still yearned for approbation. He was used to being made of, as your mother says, and it galled him to enter into our plain humdrum home life. I never saw such a hardy rooster in my life. Actually, when I got out to feed him in the morning, he would give me a cold, arrogant look that hurt my feelings. I know I'm not what you would call an educated man, nor a polished man, though I claim to have a son that is both of said things, but I hate to have a rooster crow over me because he has had better advantages and better breeding than I have, so there was no love lost between us, as you can see. Directly, I noticed that the hen began to have spells of vertigo, she would be standing in a corner of the hen retreat, reverting to her joyous childhood at Fremont O, when all at once she would fall senseless to the earth and there lie prone upon the sward, to use the words of a great writer whose address has been mislaid. She would remain in this comatose condition for between five minutes, perhaps. Then she would rally a little, slowly pry open her large, mournful eyes and seem to murmur, Where am I? I could see that she was evading the egg issue in every way and ignoring the great object for which she was created. With the ability to lay eggs from worth four dollars to five seventy-five per dozen delivered on the cars, I could plainly see that she proposed to roll up this great talent in a napkin and play the invalid act. I do not disguise the fact, Henry, that I was mad. I made a large rectangular affidavit in the inner temple of the horse barn that this poker dot hen should never live to say that I had sent her to the seashore for her health when she was eminently fitted by nature to please the public with her lay. I therefore gave her two weeks to decide on whether she would contribute a few of her meritorious articles or insert herself into a chicken pie. She still continued haughty to the last moment. So did her partner. We therefore treated ourselves to a nine-dollar dinner in April. I then got some expensive eggs from the F at East. They were not robust eggs. They were laid during a time of Great Depression, I judge so they were that way themselves also. They came by express and were injured while being transferred at Chicago. No one has traveled over that line of railroad since. I do not say that the eggs were bad, but I say that their instincts and their inner life wasn't what they ought to have been. In early May I bought one of these incubators that does the work of ten setting hens. I hoped to head off the hen so far as possible, simply purchasing her literary efforts and editing them to suit myself. I cannot endure the society of low-bred hen, and a refined hen seems to look down on me, and so I thought if I could just get one of them automatic incubators, I could have the whole process under my own control, and if the blooded hens want to go to the sanitarium and sit around there with their hands in their pockets while the great hungry world of traffic clamored for more spring chickens fried in butter, they might do so and be doggoned. Thereupon I bought one of the medium-sized two-story hatchers and loaded it with eggs. 
In my dreams I could see a long procession of fuzzy little chickens marching out of my little incubator arm in arm every day or two while my bank account swelled up like a deceased horse. I was dreaming one of these dreams night before last at midnight's holy hour when I was rudely awakened by a gallon of cold water in one of my ears. I arose in the darkness and received a squirt of cold water through the window from our ever-watchful and courageous fire department. I opened the easement for the purpose of thanking them for this little demonstration, wholly unsolicited on my part, when I discovered the Henry was in flames. I went down to assist the department, forgetting to put on my pantaloons, as is my custom out of deference to the usages of good society. We saved the other buildings, but the hatchery is a mass of smoldering ruins. So am I. It seems that the kerosene lamp which I kept burning in the incubator for the purpose of maintaining an even temperature, and also for the purpose of showing the chickens the weight of the elevator in case they should hatch out in the night, had torched up and ignited the hatchery, so to speak. I see by my paper that we are importing 200 million of hen's eggs from Europe every year. It'll be 300 million next year so far I'm concerned, Henry, and you can bet your little pleated jacket on it too if you want to. Today I send P.O. order number 143876 for $3.50. I agree with the Bible that the fool and his money are soon parted. Your father, Bill Nye. End of chapter 12. Chapter 13 of Bill Nye's Cordwood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Bill Nye's Cordwood by Bill Nye Chapter 13 Bill Nye on Tobacco A Discourager of Cannibalism I am glad to notice a strong effort on the part of the Friends of Humanity to encourage those who wish to quit the use of tobacco. To quit the use of this weed is one of the most agreeable methods of relaxation. I have tried it a great many times, and I can safely say that it has afforded me much solid felicity. To violently reform and cast away the weed, and at the end of a week to find a good cigar unexpectedly in the quiet, unostentatious pocket of an old vest, affords the most intense and delirious delight. Scientists tell us that a single drop of the concentrated oil of tobacco on the tongue of an adult dog is fatal. I have no doubt about the truth or cohesive power of this statement, and for that reason I have always been opposed to the use of tobacco among dogs. Dogs should shun the concentrated oil of tobacco, especially if longevity be any object to them. Neither would I advise a man who may have canine tendencies, or a strain of that blood in his veins, to use the concentrated oil of tobacco as a sozodont. To those who may feel that way about tobacco, I would say, shun it by all means. Shun it as you would the deadly upas tree, or the still more deadly whipple tree of the tropics. And what I may say under this head, please bear in mind I do not speak of the cigarette. I am now confining my remarks entirely to the subject of tobacco. The use of the cigarette is, in fact, beneficial in some ways, and no pest house should try to get along without it. It is said that they are very popular in the Orient, especially in the Lazar houses, where life would otherwise become very monotonous. Scientists who have been unable to successfully use tobacco, and who therefore have given their whole lives and the use of their microscopes to the investigation of its horrors, say that cannibals will not eat the flesh of tobacco-using human beings. And yet we say to our missionaries, No man can be a Christian and use tobacco. I say, and I say it too, with all that depth of feeling which has always characterized my earnest nature, that in this we are committing a great error. What have the cannibals ever done for us as a people that we should avoid the use of tobacco in order to fit our flesh for their tables? In what way have they sought to ameliorate our condition in life that we should strive in death to tickle their palates? Look at the history of the cannibal for past ages. Read carefully his record, and you will see that it has been but the history of a selfish race. Cast your eye back over your shoulder for a century, and what do you find to be the condition of the cannibalists? A new missionary has landed a few weeks previous, perhaps. A little group is gathered about on the beach beneath a tropical tree. Representative cannibals from adjoining islands are present. The odor of sanctity pervades the air. 
The chief sits beneath a new umbrella looking at the pictures in a large concordance. A new plug hat is hanging in a tree nearby. Anon the leading citizens gather about on the ground, and we hear the chief ask his attorney general whether he will take some of the light or some of the dark meat. That is all. Far away in England the paper contains the following personal. Wanted. A young man to go as missionary to supply vacancy in one of the cannibal islands. He must fully understand the appetites and tastes of the cannibals, must be able to reach their inner nature at once, and must not use tobacco. Applicants may communicate in person or by letter. Is it strange that under those circumstances those who frequented the cannibal islands during the last century should have quietly accustomed themselves to the use of a peculiarly pernicious, violent, and all-pervading brand of tobacco? I think not. To me the statement that tobacco-tainted human flesh is offensive to the cannibal does not come home with crushing power. Perhaps I do not love my fellow man so well as the cannibal does. I know that I am selfish in this way, and if my cannibal brother desires to polish my wishbone, he must take me as he finds me. I cannot abstain wholly from the use of tobacco in order to gratify the pampered tastes of one who has never gone out of his way to do me a favor. Do I ask the cannibal to break off the pernicious use of tobacco because I dislike the flavor of it in his brisket? I will defy any respectable resident of the cannibal islands today to place his finger on a solitary instance where I have ever, by word or deed, intimated that he should make the slightest change in his habits on my account, unless it be that I may have suggested that a diet consisting of more anarchists and less human beings would be more productive of general and lasting good. My own idea would be to send a class of men to these islands so thoroughly imbued with their great object, and the oil of tobacco, that the great Caucasian chowder of those regions would be followed by such weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth, and such remorse and repentance and gastric upheavals, that it would be as unsafe to eat a missionary in the cannibal islands as it is to eat ice cream in the United States today. End of chapter 13 Recording by Philip Gould Chapter 14 of Bill Nye's Cordwood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Bill Nye's Cordwood by Bill Nye. Bill Nye's Arctic Lee. The excitement consequent upon the anticipated departure of Mr. Gilder for the North Pole has recently awakened in the bosom of the American people a new interest in what I may term that great terra incognita, if I may be pardoned for using a phrase from my own mother tongue. Let us for a moment look back across the bleak waste of years and see what wonderful progress has been made in the discovery of the pole we may then ask ourselves who will be the first to tack this location notice on the nod and season crack surface of the pole itself and what will he do with it after he has filed upon it iceland i presume was discovered about 860 a d or 1,026 years ago, but the stampede to Iceland has always been under control, and you can get quarter lots in the most desirable cities of Iceland, and wear a long rickety name with links in it like a rosewood sausage, today at a low price. Nadodur, a Norwegian Viking, discovered Iceland A.D. 860, but he did not live to meet Lieutenant Greeley or any of our most celebrated northern tourists. Why Nadodur yearned to go north and discover a colder country than his own, why he should seek to wet his feet and get icicles down his back in order to bring to light more snowbanks and chilbanes, I cannot at this time understand. Why should a robust and prosperous Viking roam around 
in the cold trying to nose out more frost-bitten Esquimaux when he could remain at home and vike. But I leave this to the thinking mind. Let the thinking mind grapple with it. It has no charms for me. Moreover, I haven't that kind of a mind. Ochther, another Norwegian gentleman, sailed around North Cape and crossed the Arctic Circle in 890 A.D., but he crossed it in the night and didn't notice it at the time. Two or three years later, Eric the Red took a large snow shovel and discovered the east coast of Greenland. Eric the Red was a Northman, and he flourished about the ninth century and before the war. He sailed around in that country for several years, drinking bay rum and bear's oil and having a good time. He wore fur underclothes all the time, winter and summer, and invaded the poll tax for a long time. Eric also established a settlement on the southeast coast of Greenland, in about latitude 60 degrees north. These people remained here for some time, subsisting on shrimp salad, sea moss farina, and neat's foot oil. But finally they became so bored with the quiet country life and the backward springs that they removed from there to a land that is fairer than day, to use the words of another. They removed during the holidays, leaving their axle grease and all they held dear, including their remains. From that on down to 1380, we hear or read varying and disconnected accounts of people who have been up that way, acquired a large red chibane, made an observation, and died. Representatives from almost every quarter of the globe have been to the far north, eaten their little hunch of jerked polar bear, and then the polar bear has eaten his little hunch of jerked explorer, and so the good work went on. The polar bear, with his wonderful retentive faculties, has succeeded in retaining his great secret regarding the pole, together with the man who came there to find about it. So up to 1380, a large number of nameless explorers went to the celebrated watering place, shot a few pemmican, ate a jerked whale, shuddered a couple of times, and died. It has been the history of Arctic exploration from the earliest ages. Men have taken their lives and a few doughnuts in their hands, wandered away into the uncertain light of the frozen north, made a few observations to each other regarding the backward spring, and then cached their skeletons forever. In 1380, two Italians named Lem took a load of sun-kissed bananas and made a voyage to the extreme north. But the historian says that the accounts are so conflicting, and as the stories told by the two brothers did not agree, and neither ever told it the same on two separate occasions, the history of their voyage is not used very much. Years rolled on. Boys continued to go to school and see in their geographies enticing pictures of men in expensive fur clothing, running sharp iron spears and dangerous stab knives into ferocious white bears, and snorting around on lake cakes of cold ice, and having a good time. These inspired the growing youth to rise up and do likewise. So every nation neath the sun has contributed its assortment of choice, white skeletons and second-hand clothes to the remorseless maw of the hungry and ravenous north. And still the great pole continued to squeak on through days that were six months long and nights that made breakfast seem almost useless. In 1477, Columbus went up that way but did not succeed in starving to death. He got a bird's-eye view of a large deposit of dark blue ice, got hungry, and came home. During the 15th and 16th centuries, the northern nations of Europe, 
and especially the Dutch, kept the discovery business red-hot, but they did not get any fragments of the true pole. The maritime nations of Europe, together with other foreign powers, dynasties, and human beings, for some time had spells of visiting the polar seas and neglecting to come back. It was the custom then, as it is now, to go twenty rods farther than any other man had ever been, eat a deviled bootleg, curl up, and perish. Thousands of the best and brightest minds of all ages have yielded to this wild desire to live on sperm oil, painkiller, and jerked walrus. Keep a little blue diary for thirteen weeks, and then feed it to a tall white bear with red gums. That is not all. Millions of gallons of whiskey are sent to these frozen countries and used by the explorer in treating the untutored Esquimaux, who are not, and never will be, voters. It seems to me utterly ill-advised and shamefully idiotic. End of chapter 14 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 15 of Bill Nye's Cordwood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Bill Nye's Cordwood by Bill Nye. Chapter 15 Bill Nye's Answers to Correspondence. Capitalist, will you kindly furnish your address once more? You must either stop moving about so or leave someone at home to represent you. Nothing is more humiliating to a literary man of keen sensibilities than to draw its side and have the draft return with the memorandum on the back in pencil, gone to the White Mountains, or gone to Lake Elmo on another bridal tour, or gone to Bayfield to be absent several years, or gone to Minnetonka to wait till the clouds roll by. Searcher, Peru, Illinois. Cum grano salis was the motto of the ancients, and was written in blue letters at the base of the shield on a field emerald, supported by a cucumber recumbent. The author is unknown. S. Q. G. McGree's Prairie, Iowa, asks, Do you know of any place where a young man can get a good living? That depends on what you call a good living, S. Q. G. If your stomach would not revolt at plain fare, such as poor people use, come up and stop at our house a while. We don't live high, but we aim to eke out an existence, as it were. Come and abide with us, S.Q.G. Here is where the Prince of Wales comes when he gets weary of being heir apparently to the throne. Here is where Bert comes when he has stood a long time, first on one leg and then on the other, waiting for his mother to evacuate said throne. He bids dull care be gone, and clothing himself in some of my own gaudy finery, he threads a small limerick book through the vitals of a long-waisted worm. As we hie us to the bosky dell, where the plash of the pleasant-voiced brook replies to the turtle-dove's moan, there, where the pale green plush of the moss on the big flat rocks deadens the footfall of whales in me, where the tip of the long willow-bow monkeys with the stream forever, where neither powers nor principalities nor things present or things to come can embitter us, we sit there, young Regina and me, and we live more happy years in twenty minutes than a man generally lives all his whole life socked up against a hard throne, with the eagle eye of a warning constituency on him. It's a good place to come, S.Q.G., quiet but restful, full of balm for the wounded spirit and close up to nature's great North American heart. That's the idea. Perhaps I do not size you up accurately, S.Q.G., you may be a man who does not pant for the sylvan shade. Very likely you are a seaside resortist, and do not care for pants. But I simply say to you that if you are a worthy young man weary with life's great battles, beaten back perhaps and wounded, with your neck knocked crooked like a tom-tit that has run against a telegraph wire in the night, come up here into northern Wisconsin, where the butternut gleams in the autumn sunshine, and the axe-helve has her home. Come where the sky is a dark and glorious blue, and the town a magnificent red. Come where the coral cranberry nestles in the green heart of the yielding marsh, 
and the sandhill crane stands idly on the sedgy brim of the lonely lake through all the long idle day with his hands in the tail pockets of his tan-coloured coat trying to remember what he did with his handkerchief come up here s q g and be my amanuensis i want a man to go with me on a little private excursion from the dallas of the st croix to the sault st marie i want him to go with me and act as my private secretary and carry my canoe for me the salary would be small the first year but you would have a good deal of fun most any one can have fun with me we would go mostly for relaxation and to build up our systems my system is pretty well built up but it would be a pleasure to me to watch you build yours up what i need is a private secretary to go with me and take down little thinklets that i may have thought you would have nothing to carry but the canoe a small tent my gun and a typewriter i would carry the field glass i always carry the field glass because something might happen to it one time an amanuensis who went with me insisted on carrying the field glass and the second day he lost the cork out of it so we had to come back and make a new observation before we could start you would be welcome s q g welcome here in the fastness of the forest welcome where the resinous air of the spruce and the tamarack would kiss your wan cheek welcome to the rocky shores of the grand old freshwater monarch the champion heavyweight of all the great lakes welcome to the hazy lazy days of our long voluptuous autumn the twilight of the closing year welcome to the shade of the elms where the sunshine sneaks in on tiptoe and frolics with the dew and the daisies welcome to the sombre depths of the ever regretful and repentant pines whose venerable heads are first to greet the day and whose heaving bosoms hold the night come over s q g be my stenographer and i will show you where a friend of mine has concealed a watermelon patch in the very heart of his cornfield come over and we will show him how concealment like a worm may feed upon his damaged fruit till then s q g ta ta end of section fifteen recording by philip gould Chapter Sixteen of Bill Nye's Cordwood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Bill Nye's Cordwood by Bill Nye. Chapter Sixteen Bill Nye Preparing a Political Speech in Advance for a Time of Need. September One. I have just been preparing a speech for tomorrow evening at our convention it is a good speech and will take well it is also sincere i will give the outlines of the speech here so that in case i should die or slip up on a stenographer the basis of my remarks may not perish fellow citizens you have seen fit to renominate me for the office which i have held one term already viz member of congress from this district as you are aware i am a self-made man I have carved out my own career from the ground up, as I may say, till today I am your nominee for the second time. What we want these days is not so much men of marked ability as candidates, but available, careful, and judicious men. We are too apt to strive for the nomination of brilliant men of pronounced opinions, when we must need men who can be easily elected. Of what avail is a man of genius and education and robust brains and earnest convictions if we cannot elect him? He is simply a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. Therefore I would say to the youth of America, could they stand before me today, do not strive too hard or strain yourselves by endeavoring to attain some object after you are elected to office. Let your earnest convictions remain dormant should a man have convictions these days let him reserve them for his use in his own family they are not necessary in politics if a member of congress must have a conviction and earnestly feels as though he could not possibly get along another day without it let him go to the grand jury and make a clean breast of it i may say fellow citizens without egotism that i have been judicious both in the heat of the campaign and in the halls of legislation I have done nothing that could disrupt the party or weaken our vote in this district. It is better to do nothing than to do things that will be injurious to the interests of the majority. What do you care, gentlemen, for what I said or did in our great session of last winter, 
so long as I came home to you with a solidified vote for this fall, so long as I have not trodden on the toes of the Irish, the German, the Scandinavian, the Prohibitionist, the female suffragist, the anti-Mormon, or the international copyright crank. Let us be frank with each other, fellow citizens. Do you ask me on my return to you how many speeches my private secretary and the public printer attached my name to? Or how many packages of fly-blown turnip seed I sent to you during the last two years? No. You ask yourself how is the vote of our party this fall as compared with two years ago? And I answer that not a vote has been mislaid or a ballot erased. I have done nothing and said nothing that a carping constituency could get hold of. Though I was never in Congress before, old members envied me the long, blank, evasive, and irreproachable record I have made. No man can say that even under the stimulating influence of the wine cup I have given utterance in the last two years to anything that could be distorted into an opinion. And so today I come back to you and find my party harmonious, while others return to their homes to be greeted by a disrupted constituency over whose ruins the ever-alert adversary clambers to success. So I say to you tonight, Mr. President and gentlemen of the Convention, let us leave to the newspapers the expression of what we call earnest convictions, convictions that arise up in after years to belt us across the face and eyes. Let injudicious young men talk about that kind of groceries. But the wary self-made politician who succeeds does not do that way. It seems odd to me that young men will go on year after year trying to attain distinction by giving utterance to opinions when they can see for themselves that we do not want such men for any place whatever, from jurymen to congressmen. If you examine my record for the last session, for instance, you will not find that I spent the day pounding my desk with an autograph album and filling the air with violent utterances pro or con, and then sat up nights to get myself interviewed by the disturbing elements of the press. No, sir. I am not a disturber, a radical, or a disruptor. At Washington I am a healer, and at home in my ward I am also a healer. What America wants today is not so much a larger number of high-browed men who will get up on their hind feet and call on heaven to paralyze their right arms before they will do a wrong act, or ask to have their tongues nailed to the ridgepole of their mouths, rather than utter a false or dangerous doctrine. That was customary when the country was new and infested with bears, when men carried their guns to church with them and drank bay rum as a beverage. These remarks made good pieces for boys to speak, but they will not do now. What this country needs is a Congress about as equally balanced as possible politically, so that when one side walks up and smells of an appropriation, the other can growl in a low tone of voice from December till dog days. In this way, by a pleasing system of postponements, previous questions, points of order, reference to committees, laying on the table, and general oblivion, a great deal may be evaded and people at home who do not closely read and remember the congressional record will not know who was to blame. Judicious inertness and a gentle air of evasion will do much to prevent party dissension. I have done that way, and I look for the same old majority that we had at the former election. I often wonder if Daniel Webster would have the nerve to get up and talk as freely about things now as he used to when politics had not reached the present state of perfection. We often hear people ask why we haven't got any Websters in Congress now. I can tell you. They are sat down on long before they get that far along. They are not encouraged to say radical things and split up the vote. I will now close, thanking you for your kind preferment. I will ever strive while representing you in Congress to retain my following, and never, by word or deed, endeavor to win fame and applause there at the expense of votes at home. I care not to be embalmed in the school speakers and declaimers of future ages, provided my tombstone shall bear upon it the simple, poetic refrain, He Got There. End of chapter 16 Recording by Philip Gould